Uh, first of all, I'd like to say welcome to everyone as well. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. And thanks very much to the Shire of Yarra Rangers uh, for inviting me to talk and for showing such a continued um, and growing interest in native plants and habitat. And um, it's, it's all quite exciting. I'd like to thank uh, Jen and Sarah, um, especially for uh, helping get this off the ground. So I have a, um, a PowerPoint presentation, which I will go to and talk my way through. Then I have got, I'm just going to slowly uh, come around here. I've got a table full of uh, indigenous plants to talk about. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions afterwards. I know a lot of people have um, usually quite a few questions about plants and, and habitat. Uh, so I'll I'll leave a decent amount of room for that. So, but now I'm going to share my screen and get into the presentation proper. Um, and then I'll come back and show you the plants. Showing the plants is a little bit clunky um, via computer and very much not the same as being in the same room as people and people coming up and touching them and feeling them and smelling them. Um, so that um, sort of sensory element is obviously missing, uh, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, but hopefully you'll you'll get the names of the plants, and then I can create a list of the plants that I talk about, um, and that'll give you a, a bit of an understanding of qu quite a number of plants. So I will share my screen now and get into the presentation. Okay, so this is about um, attracting wildlife to our gardens and um, so I essentially I'm just going to talk a little bit about what is habitat and um, biodiversity and all those things that we, um, words that we hear bandied around the place a lot. So let's get into it. So um, food webs and chains, we hear all about those and so a, a, a little bit just to, I suppose, put it in context of um, which even though these are sort of broad scale um, ideas, uh, everything is related on a smaller scale in our own gardens. So many of you would have heard the really inspiring, incredible story of uh, the, the Yellowstone National Park and the grey wolf and essentially um, hopefully there's enough of you uh, who are listening and watching who haven't heard the story. Um, so essentially the grey wolf was hunted in Yellowstone National Park and it was hunted to um, until there was no wolves left in the park whatsoever. And the grey wolf is the apex predator of the park. So by the early 1920s, there were no more grey wolves in the park. And over the next few decades, the, the park fell into really disrepair, essentially because uh, elk and um, deer had run of the place and um, they were eating all the saplings, they were eating all the foliage, they um, didn't have to uh, run around the place because they weren't being hunted by anything so they were creating wallows and um, along the riverbank and changing the, the form of the riverbank and so there was big problems in the park essentially and eventually ecologists and biologists thought oh you know perhaps the fact that the grey wolf the the apex predator is not in the park maybe that's a bit of an issue here so they began a breeding program and uh, by then hunting for the wolf was banned and they reintroduced the wolf back into the park and over the next uh, 20 30 years uh, the park essentially began repairing itself what happened was the, the deer and the elk were forced to move around a lot more because they were being hunted. And because they were being hunted, their numbers dropped drastically. Uh, they eventually sort of built up to a sustainable level again. But what happened was that um, the saplings and, and the young trees were, were allowed to grow to a decent height. They were then able to flower and fruit and set seeds. So the animals that relied on these plants uh, could start breeding up and move back into the park in more numbers. One of the incredible animals that um, is linked with the Yellowstone National Park is the beaver. And we all know the incredible dams that they build out of timber. So essentially they will gnaw away at saplings that are along the river bank and drag them into the river and create these incredible dams. And uh, what those dams do is they slow the seasonal fluctuations of the water and make it a more hospitable place for fishes and ducks and otters and all 
all those little critters that use the nooks and crannies in, in the beavers um, dams. Uh, so over time, just by bringing back one animal into the park, um, th there was this incredible resurrection of the Yellowstone National Park. So it really shows how one animal, either being there or not being there, can have a positive or negative impact. Now, a little bit closer to home and something which um, some of you may well be associated with is the uh, helmeted honey eater and the lowland leadbeater's possum. So these two amazingly gorgeous critters um, are part of the Yellingbow um, reserve, the, the nature reserve there. And essentially both of them are threatened at the moment because of a different element. Essentially, it's because of um, the middle layer of, um, of plants in the forest. So we've got the ground covers, which are pretty much intact. And then we've got the, the trees, which also basically intact, but that middle layer of plants um, has taken a hammering for various reasons. One of the reasons being deer. Um, there's a huge problem with deer uh, through outer Melbourne. Um, and they essentially uh, graze that middle layer. They ring bark the trees with their antlers. And, um, and they also create um, really degraded river banks, which is where um, a lot of insects breed. So that middle layer of, um, of trees, of bushes, is really important essentially for the lowland leadbeater's possum because they use that as a safe highway, so to speak, to get from tree to tree so that they don't have to come down to the ground. Um, but now they have been forced to come down to the ground. So obviously they're preyed upon by feral cats and foxes and and things. And also that's a, a nesting site for, for the birds. So um, essentially there was a couple of groups that developed the helmeted, friends of the helmeted honey eaters and friends of the um, possum. And they plant, they grow and plant thousands and thousands of indigenous plants and, and put them back into the, into the forests every year. And um, the numbers have grown i think the helmeted honey eater has gone from something like 80 birds in the wild to i think maybe 250 or something now um, and then there's also captive breeding programs for example at, at healsville sanctuary that are making a really big difference so i sort of present those as two um, large scale examples i suppose of what um, the positive impact that you can make on such a big scale and um essentially it's a, the type of impact that we can also make in our gardens which um, is really quite incredible to think so just by bringing back various uh, plants you can have a big impact on on the fauna in the garden just a, a quick image here to talk about different food webs and chains and of course there's food webs and chains above ground there's food webs and chains in water and there's food webs and chains underground in the soil and they all have a big impact um, on our gardens as gardeners we know that we feed the soil to keep our plants healthy so we don't necessarily feed the plants as such we feed the soil we want to get that microbial action happening in the soil we want it to be alive we want there to be enough air pockets so that water and um, other things can move through we want our worms in there we want our beetles and other decomposers because they all make a really healthy difference to our plants and the healthier the soil is essentially the healthier our plants are going to be Biodiversity is a word that really gets bandied around a lot. And I've, I've sort of come up with a little example which makes it sort of clearer as to how important it is. So if you can imagine, for example, that um, humans could only eat apples, uh, we could only wear clothes made of cotton, and we could only live in weatherboard houses, um, you can see how easy it would be for us to be under threat and in trouble if any one of those suddenly got wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, if there were no more apples left, honestly, what are we going to eat? But 
if we could eat apples and potatoes, we could wear clothes made of cotton and wool, and we could live in either weatherboard or brick homes, very quickly you can see that our chances of survival have increased. So essentially biodiversity comes, it breaks down to to mean a diversity of biology. And it's generally thought that the higher the biodiversity, um, the, the better it is. So the greater the chances of our survival. And it's the same in our gardens. The more biodiversity there is, uh, the, the healthier our gardens are going to be. Uh, so we've got a lot of birds in Australia. We've got about 900 species generally, and a, a lot of them are seabirds, obviously, because we have such a, a broad coastline. Um, but we've got about 200 species that we could hopefully expect to sort of see in our garden sort of a, around the Melbourne area. So the figures on the, the left um, in these pictures are the figures of the number of um, that particular type of bird Australia wide and then um, versus what we sort of got in in the Melbourne region so you can see that we've got I mean who would have thought you know like honey eaters look how many honey eaters we've got you know 55 species all together and um, 20 sort of sort of in the Melbourne area so there's there's a lot of incredible birds uh, generally speaking, it is the larger birds or the medium and larger birds which um, tend to have adapted to suburban living a bit better than the smaller birds. Um, they are certainly affected more, um, but it doesn't matter what um, the bird is, whether it's a meat eater or, or a, um, a nectar feeder, essentially pretty much all of them um, will eat insects at some point. So if we think about uh, creating an insect attracting garden, and then we're going to be creating a garden by default that um, suits birds a lot more. So what do what are some of the things that birds need? Well, they need water. Of course, everything needs water to drink. So our birds need uh, water at different depths. Um, I've, at my garden here, I've got about 13 or 14 different bird baths um, dotted around the place or hydration stations, as I like to call them, because everything, every critter needs water. Um, the magpies and the uh, cockies will go in the deeper bird baths, whereas the, we've got wrens, we've got pardalotes, we've got other the, um, small brown birds, um, who knows what they are, <laughs> so many of them, uh, they will only go in the shallow bird baths. And, um, and I like to keep those shallow bird baths there. Generally, I put them near shrubs because the little birds feel much safer if there's shrubbery nearby and that they can sort of dart in and out of. Um, whereas the bigger birds, they're much more comfortable coming down into open spaces. So you can you can put them into open spaces. But essentially, if, if you've got a bird bath, if it's in a sunny position, you're going to be needing to clean it out a lot more, um, possibly even daily through through the summer when algae starts forming. If it's in the shade, obviously algae is not going to form as quickly. Uh, so you won't need to be uh, cleaning it out and filling it up as often. But honestly, if there's one thing um, that people could do if you're trying to attract more birds into the garden, just get some more water in there. And um, if birds have got really keen eyesight and they know when there's a new water, water bowl around. Um, also like to put in rocks and pebbles and, and sticks. So if it is a little bit deep and something falls out, they've at least got a chance um, of something to scramble out on. Uh, birds also love dust bathing. Now, I don't know why I was surprised to learn that wild birds, um, birds love it as well. I've got um, chickens, I've got eight chooks, and they spend a lot of time dust bathing. Um, so it makes sense that wild birds do as well. And um, they do that to help reduce the oil in their feathers, reduce the oil buildup and to um, help with parasites, things like that. And researchers have found that birds that don't have access to either dust or water for bathing in, they fly more poorly. And obviously, if they're flying more poorly, then everything else is going to get affected. Uh, so, so birds also use water for socialising. Um, 
as you can see that um, bottom right pick, the little uh, silver eyes there, uh, they, they will come down. But even the bigger birds, the cockies, they certainly like to come down together and, and have a bit of a chat and, and um, as well as a drink and a bath. Uh, what birds need in terms of nesting, obviously different things depending on where, whether they build a, a mud nest like our swallows or chuffs, things like that. Um, but essentially for the small birds that we're trying to attract, we want to think of uh, dent shrubs and or thorny shrubs. Uh, so these, the, the top left one is a plant called sweet Bessaria or uh, Bessaria spinosa it's indigenous to the shire of yarra it's uh, slightly prickly uh, and the insects go absolutely nuts for it it's high in nectar and um, it looks really pretty when it's in flower and it looks really pretty when it's seeding as well uh, so that is definitely one for the garden you can prune it back uh, quite readily. Over time it may even grow into a small tree with a single trunk but generally speaking it stays as a shrub uh, with its foliage down to the ground so it's a really good screening plant as well. Um, yeah, depending on what size garden you've got. Um, the middle plant is Grevillea rosemary folia, and this particular one is Scarlet Sprite. Uh, again, really dense. It's sort of prickly, but not overly prickly. It's not super thorny when you touch it. Uh, has uh, little red Grevillea flowers. So, um, sorry, and this is again an indigenous one. And um, and that's the thing with, with the Grevilleas, Often we like those really big flowering grevilleas and, you, and they're gorgeous and everyone loves them and they're usually prolific flowers. Um, no reason to not have them in the garden. But oftentimes you'll see that they're, they're on plants that are really generally quite open. They've got big foliage. And so the wattle birds and other bigger honey eaters can access them really easily. And they tend to get quite territorial about um, whether it's the grevillea peaches and cream or superb or anything like that. And they will chase the little birds away. Whereas something like this grevillea rosemary folia, as you can see, it's really dense. It's quite tight. Uh, little birds can get in and feed really easily whereas the wattle birds not quite as easily so the little birds have got a, a good chance so it's not about having one or the other but if we can sort of um, find room for both then we suit both both groups of birds the picture on the far right is one of the banksias Banksia is really high in nectar as are grevilleas and the bottle brushes the calismans um, very high nectar so you will get those um, insects coming in the birds coming in um, then the bottom left picture is one of the pandareas pandaria pandarana which is the wonga vine and um, as you can see that's been uh, growing beautifully along a, a gate there and um, again so you don't have to necessarily have if you don't have room for shrubs or things like that you can grow a climber that will be really dense as well so I mean that is a perfect spot for little birds to nest in. Um, then essentially I often will put out a little bowl sort of through winter when birds are starting to build their nests and that's a really important thing to do especially in the suburbs as well where may, there might not be enough natural materials around sticks bits of grass um, chook feathers if you keep chooks um, bits of moss that those sorts of things that they line their nests with that's and it's always good to see the birds coming down it's a fun thing to do if you put it near a window or something you've got kids or grandkids uh, to watch the birds coming down to select their um, their choice pieces for the nest um, and then on the right that's a kangaroo grass themida triandra um, really multitasking grass, um, but in terms of um, being suitable for birds, uh, they will come down when, when it browns off a bit and use the, um, the thin blades of grass to create their nests. 
Um, birds and other critters, you can see by the numbers there, there's a, we've got a lot of critters that use hollows. And uh, of course, one of the problems is, especially in suburban areas, that um, if there's hollows in trees, it means they're starting to get a little bit um, potentially dangerous in terms of dropping their limbs, uh, which can be a problem because, of course, we don't want branches falling on houses or people or cars as they have been um, prone to do over especially over this last year for some bizarre reason a lot of trees falling around the place um, so what you can do if you do have a large tree on the property that is, you're starting to become worried about instead of removing the whole tree you can prune it back and create this sort of stag tree um, essentially and what that essentially means it's a it's it, this is if it's a, a dead tree just really reduce the branches down so the tree remains in situ but there's not going to be any dangerous branches that could potentially fall if you do have a branch fall and it's practical uh, leave it in situ it'll break down over time it'll form start forming hollows it'll become you know a, a environment in its own right i mean trees that are dead are, are in a sense still living because you have the decomposers who move in and they will start breaking it down so that's a whole ecological environment in itself and the birds will come and feed on that so um, might look dead to us but they actually are still living However, if you don't have any trees or you don't have trees with hollows, as we know, and we can see many of our birds and animals will take to nesting boxes. There's, you can either buy or make different sizes, but essentially um, most critters will happily accept any, any nesting box. And uh, yeah, you can see this, the, the possums there, especially they will squeeze themselves into any tiny little hole. But uh, yeah, the more nesting boxes we can have around the place, really the better, because they are uh, few and far between, especially, especially through the suburbs. Uh, yeah, so what birds need in terms of uh, food, obviously nectar, fruit, seeds, insects, and meat. And uh, yeah, so as I was saying before, if we start developing a garden that is really suitable for insects, by default, we're going to be creating a garden that is fantastic for frogs. And obviously, there's things that feed on frogs, birds that feed on frogs, um, birds that feed on lizards, kookaburras love a skink, and um, they're, they're the ones that feed on insects as well. So it's all about developing those food webs and chains. Um, as I said, so any of the bottle brushes are high in nectar, your grevilleas are high in nectar, things like corias are high in nectar, and what's fabulous about the corias is the, um, the um, honey eaters will come in, like the spinebills and things will come in for the nectar, and then when the seeds start forming things, the parrot eaters like the uh, rosellas and the king parrots, they'll come in and eat the seeds, so they're sort of multitasking in that way as well. Banksias, eucalypts, of course, extremely high in nectar. Um, Cacias, low in nectar, but high in pollen. And pollen is the um, protein source, whereas nectar, of course, is your carbohydrate source. So um, by having both of those, you're supplying um, both nutrients in the garden, which is extremely important. Acacias do have a small amount of nectar, um, but essentially higher, higher in pollen and um, the protein source. Just further resources for anyone who's interested. Um, I use the that Australian Birds app, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think it's costs about $20, so more than a lot of apps, but honestly, I use it many times a day and it's got some fabulous features. So uh, really good for trying to ID birds um, in terms of um, what they look like and what they sound like as well. Uh, butterflies. Uh, we all love butterflies. There's about 400 um, butterfly species in Australia, um, probably about 25-ish, which um, we could hope to see around our Melbourne gardens. And essentially butterflies are nectar feeders, well the adults are nectar feeders, and um, as we know the 
caterpillars are the foliage feeders. So it's uh, it can be hard in our gardens to not um, look at a caterpillar that's feeding and, and want to squash it or spray it. But um, if we can resist that temptation, um, it usually, generally speaking, depending on the plant, of course, um, hopefully it won't decimate the plant and it could eventuate in a, a beautiful butterfly or even a moth and we need our moth species as well. Um, so what do butterflies like? Essentially, while they do certainly like the flat flowers, um, like our daisies and um, chrysocephalums and those sorts of things, um, the butterflies are pretty clever and they have a long proboscis and they will use that in longer flowers such as the pacris and um, um, corias, those sorts of things. So essentially, you know, people come into the nursery where I work. I work at Karanga Nursery for those people who don't know. And they um, are really keen to plant plants for um, butterflies and bees especially and I just say just plant a range just plant a range of colors and a range of shapes and essentially all of any of the plants have got something to offer some critter in the garden um, bees more attracted to the lighter colors and and the mauves and things like that they don't see red very well um, but there's also the scent of the plant to be taken into account as well and and some of the red flowering plants that maybe bees don't see as well um, ha, are quite highly scented and so they will be attracted by the scent as well so um, that pretty much you can't go wrong with with anything so if you just plant a range of plants that will flower through the year um, the the photos down the bottom there that or well, sorry the two central photos down the bottom there I've got um, finger limes in the garden and a couple of years ago I discovered these um, very cute little yellow black red and white caterpillars and I did what everyone usually does and freaks out and saw them all over the plant and thought oh my goodness is it gonna are they gonna decimate the plant so I thought I'll just watch and they didn't decimate the plant um, they are the um, larvae of the dainty swallowtail butterfly and uh, they created chrysalises and then a few months later I was out there at the right time and um, the butterflies started emerging and that's the one in the sort of centre at the bottom picture and they spent half an hour 40 minutes just coming out drying their wings getting that fluid pumping through into the wings and then they took flight so that for me was a really huge joy. And if I'd gone around and, and squashed or sprayed those caterpillars, I wouldn't then have had the joy of seeing the butterfly come out months later. Um, so we need to plant plants that the larvae need. Um, acacias, there's a huge number of species of moths and butterflies that use acacia species. Um, grasses and sedges are really um, high on the list of plants that um, they will lay their eggs on. Uh, Themida triandra, the kangaroo grass, which is, um, I can show you in a minute, um, is su supposed to support uh, the larvae of at least 13 species of butterfly. So, and I'm sure many moth species as well. So, I mean, if you only planted one grass in your garden, you could plant the kangaroo grass. Um, yeah, native bees, amazingly, we have, you know, at least 2,000 species of native bees. Uh, they're generally pretty tiny, don't, um, don't notice them as much as we do the honeybees. Um, but they're fantastic pollinators in the garden. It's been found that they actually, native bees, wasps and, and other insects, our wild insects actually pollinate our veggie and fruit plants better even than honeybees. So it's a good excuse to have bushes and, and other indigenous plants sort of around our produce gardens because um, they, they make a big difference that way. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, moths, we've got um, about 22,000 species of moths, which is quite incredible. And, and um, I did sort of think, you know, from an ecological point of view, why do we have 
only 400 species of butterflies but 22,000 species of moths and when I thought about it I was like oh because think of the when moths come out they come out at night and most of our uh, mammals are essentially nocturnal and even frogs are nocturnal and a huge part of those critters diet is moths so it makes total sense so we might think of moths as being quite drab and uh, quite annoying sometimes but um, they're huge hugely essential part of the ecosystem so I certainly look at moths with with new eyes now um, moths and uh, or butterflies especially and other insects um, they like to have rocks to sunbake on they all need a water source so you could have a very shallow bath with marbles or pebbles or something so that the water is only just covering them so they can come and get their water safely uh, butterflies also like to have uh, a plate full of uh, rotting fruit they will certainly come down and feed on that very interestingly um, but then you can see the top right picture I've also I created a, a little insect hotel there and that's um, been taken up I've created that a while ago now and it's got a whole bunch of things in it, including some little spiders uh, some grass wasps and, and native bees and things so it's a fun project to do with the kids and and it shows you what ecology uh, you've got in the garden our frogs so we've got just over 200 species of frogs in australia uh, or oh, think, think it's about 240 or something like that and about 10 species so that are um that we could see in our melbourne gardens although there are some um sort of tree frogs which are more um, indigenous to sort of Sydney area sort of moving down here and I think they've been moving down in plants we often see them at the nursery um, in fact yesterday I saw one and honestly it was the size of the fingernail on my small finger so it shows how little they can be um, and they also like to rest in hollows and, and hide in hollows so it shows you don't need to have giant branches with huge hollows to make an impact um, ecologically on the critters in the garden and ditto that with lizards and other uh, skinks and other lizards you know small hollows are just as effective as the big hollows um, so we've got of course we've got our tree frogs and we've got our ground frogs ground frogs tend to be uh, sort of rounder um, whereas um, oh, sorry the ground frogs tend to be a bit more rounder um, and the tree frogs sort of a little bit flatter which enables them to um, sit vertically on surfaces and tree frogs have also got um, much more sort of padded feet which enables them to sucker onto things a lot more easily what do they eat they eat anything that fits in their mouth essentially anything living that fits in their mouth and so the bigger the frog the bigger the critter that they will eat um, again moths and other insects form a huge part of their diet um, really good reason not to be spraying too much in the garden um, to allow those um, little insects to thrive so that our froggy friends can thrive as well. In terms of how to keep them in the garden, uh, essentially you want to have a permanent water source, a little frog bog or a small pond. You want an area that's probably away from the house and away from the neighbours bedroom windows, unless you don't like them, then put them right next to the bedroom windows because uh, they can be very noisy at night and even sometimes during the day. I don't know if you can hear it, but I've got a um, pobble bonk, an eastern banjo in the pond behind me that's um, pobble bonking away as we talk. Um, but essentially frogs need both shallow areas where the tadpoles will hang out and deeper areas where the frogs can swim. Frogs need, they can hop into a pond really easily, but they can't hop out and a frog can actually drown. Uh, so we want to have grasses that overhang or a shallow area where they can get out easily, an overhanging log, that sort of thing. An area, essentially an area that they can clamber out. Um, so that they don't drown. 
and just a couple of the apps that I use and they're fantastic they really are you can go on you you can record a frog and um, and send it into them and they'll help you identify what the frog is they will narrow down what the what the frog could potentially be given your location um, so they're a lot of fun and I've learned a lot uh, using those apps um, lizards again we've got quite a number of lizards um, in Australia we've got the different groups we've got uh, dragons skinks goannas geckos and the legless lizards which unfortunately for them look like snakes um, but you know, we might be lucky enough in the garden to have various skinks, uh, blue tongue lizards, sometimes depending on where we are. I know here we've got the little Jackie, um, Jackie lizards, which are in the dragon family. As you can see, they love sun baking, uh, similar to butterflies and, and other insects. They take the, the thermal heat from the rock to help them warm up and, and move around the place. So if you can have piles of logs, rocks, you don't even, they don't even need to be big rocks because a lot of the skinks are really small. So if you've got just a single pile of small rocks um, in a north facing area with a couple of grasses around it, honestly, that is such a good habitat for lizards. So it's quite easy uh, to create a good habitat for them because most of them in our Melbourne gardens are quite small. Um, yeah, so they use the strappy leaf plants like grasses and dianellas and things like that to, to move around easily. And honestly, all of our plants that suit one critter, they really do multitask and suit a variety of because you think if you think about it um, frogs want to move around with hanging grasses so really flat ground covers those sorts of things um, essentially anything but the open expanses of lawn or paving um, is going to be useful to our critters I just popped in here a couple of um, photos of examples. Um, both of these gardens, I know they are quite big gardens, but these are sort of small areas, which goes to show that you don't need a really big garden to be able to provide all of the things that various critters need. So here we've got some dense shrubs, we've got some um, high nectar flowering plants, we've got the rocks, we've got a um, bit of open expanse there um, and yeah grasses and and things like that they're not all native plants you can have that mix uh, critters aren't really fussy especially when it comes to nectar or um, sort of habitat they, um, they they will take what they're given essentially uh, we want to use indigenous plants as much as we can but it certainly doesn't mean that we can't have a mixed garden that's for sure uh, mammals, we don't really see them very often because they are all nocturnal. Um, of course, we've got our sugar gliders, our brush tail fasca gulls, which are super, super cute. We've got our microbats. Uh, we've got, um, uh, you know, probably about 12 microbat species in Melbourne. Um, approximately 90 species of bat altogether, with most of them being microbats, about 80 species of microbats really important ecologically um, they eat mosquitoes they eat moths um, they're yeah really really good to have around the place they will take to the microbat fauna boxes very well um, and just put that in a nice sort of sheltered part attached to the house or something like that and um, they will certainly will take to those really well um, but again, I know I keep repeating myself here, but it comes down to the insects in the garden. So all of these critters are foragers for insects and, um, you know, they, they um, will eat fruit of dianellas and, and things like that. So, yeah, the more, the more variety and biodiversity in terms of plants that we can have in the garden, the more these are um, going to support these critters. So what else can we do? Of course, cats are a major issue. Uh, there's, you know, millions of feral cats. And, um, but unfortunately it's also our family cats, our home cats, which um, get out at night or even during the day. And um, they're really adept hunters and killers. And researchers have um, 
um, when they've euthanized feral cats that they've caught and dissected them, they've found you know, up to 30 different critters, lizards and grasshoppers and things like that inside their belly. So it shows that one, one animal can have a big impact. And so these millions of cats that are about are really creating a, a bit of a, a disaster ecologically, which is a bit of a bummer. I mean, because cats are so adorable. I just say keep them in at night and um, encourage your neighbours to keep them in at night as well chemicals of course they're all designed to kill something so even if you're using um, something that's designed to kill a plant by default it will actually um, kill or hurt um, a critter as well uh, the less we can use in our gardens the better I pretty much don't use anything now um, I just uh, do all my weeding by hand, um, which can be quite hard here in the bush. But yeah, I, I, I just made the decision to stop using any chemicals. And honestly, it really paid off um, in terms of the, the amounts of birds that I see. Although I do have, um, am on the front foot in terms of what I've, what I've got in the bush here. Um, tidying up. You know, we were obsessed with tidying up and raking up and all those things and deadheading and that's all well and good, but we can also have a really positive impact if we tidy up a little bit less um, or have areas in the garden which we don't tidy up as much and we let them, that area be a little bit wild and um, I mean, you'll notice uh, even through farmland where farmers have created these big piles of um sticks and um, other rubbish other sort of um, tree rubbish and that kind of stuff and the wrens move in because there's insects there the wrens will come in so straight away they've created this sort of habitat by default uh, so essentially the less we can clean up the better um, what else do, what can we do we can look at our garden with new eyes in terms of um, our plants what is this plant contributing um, it might contribute um, like we might like it for sentimental reasons we might like it for design reasons um, we might like it for habitat reasons but if, if plants don't fulfill something uh, they don't bring you joy <laughs> then that's a plant that that you could consider replacing with something that will bring something to the garden whether it will be something from a design point of view or something from a habitat point of view Weedy plants, especially if we live near reserves, bushland or, or the bush, um, yeah, just get rid of them if you can. I had a um, still digging out uh, lilies here. I brought in some horse poo years and years ago now and some arum lilies got out of control really quickly before you know it in the bush um, on top of the situation now, but it, it happens quite quickly. Um, ditto with things like mint and of course agapanthers, those sorts of things. And they really don't contribute um, from a habitat point of view at all. Um, in fact, they are usually a hindrance. And, and a really negative impact. And the other thing I suppose is become acquainted with our indigenous plants and insects. That's a really fun thing to do. It is a lifelong journey. We're all at different sort of levels of knowledge and we can all learn from each other. Um, that's the thing I love. Everyone knows something someone else doesn't know. So, um, but just, I just continuously try to read. I've got a couple of little um, books that help me identify insects. Um, so that, that's a fun thing to do as well. Of course, there are plenty of benefits from encouraging wildlife in the garden, our enjoyment and health. Um, being out in nature from a scientific point of view has been shown to reduce our heart rate and reduce our cortisol levels, which is our stress hormone. Um, all those sorts of things, of course, extremely important from an environmental point of view. I have to say, I, I feel really happy and lucky in Australia because compared to some other countries, we really are quite focused on, at, a, at an individual level, focused on improving the environment and getting to know our local plants and animals. So, and, and councils, so many Australian councils are really on board with it, which is, makes it easier and exciting. And of course, kids, I mean, they are natural ecologists and they just love being in nature and exploring what different critters do. So 
Yeah, so these are just some of the, the critters in my garden. That's Mrs. Pospos with one of her many offspring that she's brought down over the years. She usually gets uh, half an apple or an apple a night. Um, that was a rare occasion. We'd run out of apples and she had a banana, which she was very appreciative of. The little skink in the bottom photo. Honestly, it's the same skink every summer. It comes inside a few times a week. I'm usually bare feet, nips me on the toe, demands a piece of fruit, which I have to present to it. So um, those are the things which I love about um, having a habitat garden. It's just those little interactions that make you laugh and make you enjoy life. Um, so that's, yeah, probably one of the main reasons. Okie dokie, so now I'm going to end my slideshow and um, show you some of these many plants. I'll whip through them quite quickly, but I will create a list of all the plants I've got. It, the plants are but a mere snapshot um, of what's available. So I'll say stop sharing. Okay, so hopefully you can just see me now. And I've broken my plants up into ground covers, small shrubs, medium shrubs, uh, sort of grasses and strappy plants and large shrubs. So I haven't talked about trees um, just because there's so many to talk about. We're lucky in a shire of Yarra, we've got a really broad palette of plants. Um, so now you'll hear me talk about form a lot and um, for people that might not know essentially what that means is then for for example okay so let's talk about let's start with one plant so this is myoporum parvifolium or the creeping boobiala so you can see there it's got cute little white flowers um, this form is a purple leaf form so it's got purple stems and um, sort of purple tinged foliage um, so all of the plants that I'm talking about today are indigenous to um, the Shire of Yarra Ranges area um, but there's of course cultivars which are um, selections of improved forms of indigenous plants um, so whether you choose them or whether you choose to be more of a purist and go with the um, non sort of cultivar types that's completely up to you all of these plants are still contributing in terms of habitat in the garden so um, it's not like they, you're going to have a negative um, impact by using a cultivar or a form. So this particular Myoporum parvifolium, creeping boobiella, boobiella, that's a purple leaf form. And then here is another form, and that is a fine leaf form. And then there's also the normal form, um, which has got much broader leaves. And then there's a pink flowering form. So essentially different forms of plants um, that have a broad geographical range, they um, develop slightly differently depending on the conditions, depending on the soil, depending on the climate, those sorts of things. And then their DNA structure essentially sets and they will always be that type of plant. Um, so that's why we get different forms of the same species of plant. So Myoporum um, essentially... And I will actually say, because I'll, otherwise I'll be repeating it again and again, most of these plants are suitable for full sun to part or dappled shade. Um, when we think of sort of our Melbourne conditions, most plants grow in forested areas. Um, so they, they do have sections where they're in full sun and but most of them will be in a bit of dappled shade. Um, not all of them will be in full shade and in our own gardens full shade obviously is not um, brought about by trees usually it's usually brought about by buildings um, especially on the south, south part of the house um, we have very shady conditions but there's plenty of plants um, that suit all conditions so I mean, we've got 25,000 plants Australia-wide and essentially there's a plant for any situation whatsoever Plants that grow in desert regions or coastal regions, uh, they're the plants which, generally speaking, prefer full sun. Also, if you're looking at a plant, a plant that's got grey leaves essentially is a plant which would prefer full sun. doesn't mean it won't grow in part shade or dappled shade. 
um, it might not flower as much. Or if it's a sort of a um, furry foliage plant, it might develop a bit of a fungal condition in the, in the cooler months. So they're the types of things to consider. So that's our Myoporum parvifolium. And so this is the slightly clunky bit of the presentation um, just because of the nature of it. Now, this one that I'm going to talk about. So this is, many of you will know it, it's Canidia prostrata or running postman. Now, I only saw this form at the nursery yesterday and this one is called Maroon de Blush. Um, uh, and sometimes with the cultivar name, that will tell you a lot about a plant. So Maroon de Blush, it tells me it's a plant that was most likely found in the Maroon de region. Um, and this is a, quite a dense ground cover, Canadian, and has, it's a, from the pea family, so it'll have little red pea flowers. Um, it's a dense matting plant and really good, as is the Myoporum, very matting type of ground cover, so really good for suppressing weeds. Any of the uh, ground covers are really good also for keeping, they're essentially a living mulch. So they will help keep your soil moist and they'll help keep your soil cool and more living than if it was just exposed to the sunlight all the time. So that's, yeah, Canidia prostrata. I've noticed it's got um, sort of quite woodier stems than the typical Canidia. So the different forms, yeah, they have slightly different variations. Okay, now this is a plant which many of you will know and love, if you can see that. So that is, this is um, Chrysocephalum apiculatum. Now this plant is found Australia-wide, every state and territory, which is why it's so variable in form. So you can get a Chrysocephalum apiculatum that's got little grey leaves like this one, or you can get, so this particular one is called Desert Flame. And the flowers are maybe slightly more orange tinged than a lot of the chrysocephalums. Um, but yeah, they range, some of the leaves are really big, flat, grey, and others are sort of much smaller and thinner and greener. So because it grows all over Australia, there are so many different forms available. But this is a fabulous plant for butterflies, um, hoverflies, other um, yeah, native bees, other insect critters. And from um, a habitat point of view also, it yeah, spreads really quite far, probably spread to you know maybe a metre and a half, two metres. Um, and be a really safe place for lizards to scuttle under, as are any of the ground covers. Okay. Hibertia pedunculata. Lovely, one of the, here it is here. Oh, you can see the little yellow flower there. Um, so this is known as the, oh, I always get, um, what I'm done with common names, stalked guinea flower, I think it is. Um, so, um, yeah, again, really very flat plant, also good for sort of spilling over retaining walls or rockeries or uh, along steps, that sort of thing. Quite sort of wiry-ish stems, um, bright green foliage, uh, again, full sun, dappled shade, spread to probably about a metre and a half, two metres. Um, really lovely little plant. In fact, I say that about all plants. They're all lovely. They're all my babies. Uh, this one is fabulous for cottage style gardens and you will recognize it. Um, this is uh, Brachisco multifida. This particular cultivar is called Bright Eyes. Again, um, Brachisco, there's, Brachisco multifida comes in a range of forms. This is a quite a fine leaf form and with really mauvey really pretty mauve uh, flowers. This is more of a clumping plant ra that rather than a spreading plant. So that might clump up to about 50 centimetres or so. Um, over time, it might sort of get it, sometimes they get a little bit dead in the middle and you can just hack it back. In fact, a lot of these plants, you can literally just hack back when they start um, looking a little bit off. Um, probably Brachys combed and the Chrysocephalum are two that maybe need a little bit more attention. And I suppose 
it comes down to I, I think like almost cottage type plants tend to need just that little bit more attention. Um, in terms of feeding native plants, um, we always use a native fertilizer and sure they, I mean, they grow in our soils naturally, but in our gardens, we really want them to thrive um, rather than just simply survive. So by feeding them a couple of times a year, you're going to get a plant that's really healthy and uh, flowers much more often. Uh, Okie dokie. This little baby is a ground cover form of Gardenia avata. So many of you will know um, Gardenia. So it's one of our fabulous plants. Uh, and there's also a small shrub form. This particular one is called Little Goody. And this ground cover form is one of Angus Stewart's called Gardenia Gold Cover. Um, there are a couple of forms available. But essentially, so it's the same plant, Gardenia avata, and we've got a ground cover form. We have a small shrub form that gets to about 80 centimeters. And then we have the normal form, which gets to about 1.5, 1.8. And the butterflies go nuts for these yellow flowers and they flower prol prolific prolifically. And when, so the, the tall um, gardenia can get a bit scrappy. So it's a really fast grow, but over time it can get scrappy. You can literally just hack it right down at ground level and it will sprout back up again. Really beautiful, oh, can stop wobbling sort of bright green serrated leaves. So a lot of native plants can tend to have quite sort of dull leaves, um, but sometimes we like that really nice, bright, fresh green in the garden. So these gardenias, and what I love about them, so the gold cover I actually use in hanging baskets and it absolutely works a treat. Well, it works a treat when the cockies don't decide to come along and prune them. Um, but yeah, prolific flowers and you can have a plant so you can provide that design continuity if you want to by having the taller plant, the shorter plant and the ground cover as well. So that's a fabulous choice. Okie dokie. And uh, moving on to small plants. Mm, this one's a bit tricky to see. Let me take that out. So this is a little one. You can see it's got very small gray leaves. This is Enida Newtons and this is also an edible one. Um, has tiny little red um, almost translucent berries like really tiny but they are edible and quite sweet. Um, it's, um, it forms sort of a, a bit of a mat so it might spread for up to a meter um, and get to maybe 40 odd centimeters in height. Uh, so again, really good in terms of allowing critters to, to move around it. Um, but yeah, looks fantastic in the garden, very matting, works really fantastically under um, mature trees. So that really tricky zone we, where we sometimes try to get things to grow that doesn't like growing, but they do really well in that environment. So that's Enida Newtons or Nodding Salt Bush. This is a really sweet one and I'm spewing its finished flowering. In fact, some of them, most of them have finished flowering at the moment. So a lot of our native plants are sort of uh, winter, spring flowering plants. Many will flower through summer, things like bottle brush and stuff um, will flower through the summer. But this one here, I'll show you the picture of the label actually. This is Tetratheca ciliata or pink bells. And it's also, also comes in a white flowered form. Um, it's a small shrub, might get to 60 centimetres odd. Um, again, it's a sub-story um, plant, so it doesn't mind full sun or part slash dappled shade. Um, it's a, yeah, sort of bush, might get to about 50 centimetres wide, really good in pots. Um, so it's Tetratheca ciliata. Really lovely little one. I was very excited when it, so that's also um, indigenous to my area. I'm in uh, Bend of Islands, so I'm in Nilambik Shire. And um, yeah, I, was very, I always get very excited when I find something very pretty that's um, indigenous to my area. So many of you will recognize these leaves. So this is a Hardenbergia violacea. 
or most of you will know this as the happy wanderer or native sarsaparilla plant and we know it's a climbing plant which can also be used as a ground cover but there are also three well, at least three uh, small shrub forms this particular form is called regent and it has quite broad foliage compared to some of the other um, Hardenbergia violaceas. And there's also a small shrub form called Minihaha, which has quite little leaves. And another form whose name eludes me at the moment. Essentially, they're all Hardenbergia violacea, but the small shrub forms get to probably about 80 centimetres tall and about 50 centimetres wide. They look fabulous, sort of planted as a group, um, and again, still provide um, the same benefits of the happy wanderer climber or ground cover. So Again, you can have the different forms of the same plant for that continuity um, from a design point of view. Flowers are um, really good for um, insects specifically, not, not so much the birds. Um, but yeah, the, the insects will certainly come down for a feed on those. And they're, they're yeah, the, the uh, climbing form, the Huddenbergia form, is also good as a, a nesting point. Um, I'm just going to pull this around and show you my little visitor. There's the Karawong that's come in for sausage and will probably start, um, probably start annoying me soon, but I shall continue on. Okay, so moving on to the medium shrubs. This one here, a bit hard to see. This is um, Acana Acacia Acanacea or the gold dust wattle. Um, it's a nice sort of almost like a dainty small shrub. It creates a bit of a sort of a V shape, um, almost like a, a single trunk and then the foliage on top, but quite small. So it's almost like a tiny tree in a way, um, which is fabulous because it allows you to underplant it with grasses or other ground cover type plants. So that's a gold dust bottle. It can get to about, probably about maybe 1.5 meters tall and maybe a meter ish wide that sort of thing it's not a not a huge plant but it's a it's a it's a nice plant it's a sort of a controllable plant it's not going to go too sort of ragged on you um this particular plant here so this is a form of chorea glabra this particular form i love it's called Colaban river and hopefully you can see that the reason why I love this plant is because it's very upright and it holds that upright form as um, the plant grows. So even when it's it mature form, which is probably about one and a half to 1.8 meters tall and probably roughly the same wide, um, but it has a really delightful sort of form and you don't need to do anything to it. You don't need to prune it. Whereas some of the other couriers can tend to be quite rambly and that's nice if, if that's the sort of thing that you want, but sometimes you want a plant with a bit of uh, form. Again, the couriers, there's a, one of the little flowers there. This particular one has got little sort of, doing a very bad job of showing you, but it's got little green courier type flowers, still the bell type flower, uh, again high nectar and also useful from a seed perspective. So courier glabra, which is also called the rock courier, comes in the straight form, which has sort of got reddish flowers and um, very sort of darkish glossy leaves. Um, and then it also comes in a pink flowering form as well. They're, they're a bit so sort of wider and maybe a bit sprawlier than this particular form, which again is Colaban River. This is a fantastic little shrub for uh, dry shady places. And this is uh, Pomoderis lanigera. It has beautiful soft leaves that you just want to stroke. As you can see, the sort of darker green on one side and the lighter green on the other and the really beautifully rusty uh, stems. Um, this is a, a dwarf form and gets to about 1.6. The Although the normal form, which we have through the bush here as well, I never have seen over two meters, but I guess that would depend on where they're grown. Maybe if there's a bit more moisture, they, they will get a little bit more height on them. 
Um, but yeah, so the, I mean, it's just a lovely plant to sort of have as a background plant or a border plant, hedging plant, that sort of thing. Uh, for most of the year, it just kind of looks like a nice plant. And then uh, through winter, it has its flowers um, right across the top. Um, so they're very prominent, very visible, and you'll start noticing it when the buds start coming in. So even though the flowers only there probably for a couple of months, you get the buds and then you get the um, the, the fruit and the, the seeds afterwards. So you actually have, you know, maybe six months of it sort of looking in flower. Um, which is really lovely. So that's Pomoderus lanigera or the woolly Pomoderus. Just checking how we're going for time. Okay, this is Indigofra australis or Austral indigo. And it's a really sweet little, I actually call it a small tree, gets to about roughly about two meters it's quite open so um, sometimes we want those really nice sort of plants that you can actually look through uh, I sometimes feel like we get a little bit obsessed with pruning plants and making everything really dense when in actual fact being able to look through a plant can have its advantages too because you might not want to always block a view but you might just want to sort of shut it down just a little bit so austral indigo has gorgeous uh, little purple pea flowers. And uh, yeah, quite, as you can see, they're quite ferny foliage. So um, I've created a grove of them sort of at the start in between the bush and where the garden starts proper, uh, like a mini forest of them and they, they look lovely. And um, there's a pink flowering form as well. And then a fine leaf form as well. So it's really ferny. So it almost looks like a maiden hair fern, the small leaf form. So that's austral indigo. Um, again, good for sort of dappled shade and sunny spots. Ah, this was, um, I mentioned this plant earlier. So this is Grevillea rose marinifolia. So one of the Melbourne Grevilleas. So that tells us we know it's going to do well in in clay soils a lot of people obviously around this in Melbourne area have got clay based soils and some people lament that fact but in fact clay soils um, they've got um, really good water holding capacity and and able to exchange nutrients with the plant really well so give me a clay soil over a sandy soil any day uh, so Grevillea rosemary folia um, one of the Melbourne, Melbourne Grevilleas and oh that just sort of leads me to when you're choosing plants for the garden um, always consider where it's from for example with the banksias um, there's a bunch of banksias which are what we call the east coast banksias which um, as the name suggests are native to the east coast of Australia and generally speaking they're a little bit more suitable for our gardens than um, the banksias available from um, WA which are really um, much prefer well-drained sandy type soils or gravelly type of soils and really don't enjoy our sort of wet um, cold winter clay soils very much which isn't to say you can't grow them you just need to take a bit more care if you're going to, going to grow them but for no-brainer plants go for plants that are um, indigenous to your area or sort of a slightly greater area or the east coast of Australia that is a generalization okay so back to Grevillea rose marinifolia the straight form uh, grows probably to about two and a half meters it can be a little bit ungainly there is a cultivar form called scarlet sprite which will top out max two meters tall probably about two and a half ish wide really prolific flower and this particular form is a yellow flowering form which is uh, called lutea l-u-t-e-a and which essentially means green flowering and that's you can often um, one of the reasons for understanding um, the latin names of plants is they often explain a lot about the plant. So for example, Grevillea rosemary foliad has got foliage that is rosemary-like. So it, it, it often describes the plant um, in a way that helps you remember what the plant looks like. So that's one good reason for learning the names of them. 
Um, yeah, so this form again, um, it's a similar size to the Scarlet Sprite, so it tops out at about two ish meters tall and wide. Um, really dense, the same as the typical rosemary folia. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm fiddling around with it, so it's not too prickly, but it's um, yeah, a dense plant and fine foliage, so fantastic for the little birds. And the rosemary folia flowers along the stem, so the birds can get into the plant and feed on it really easily. Okay, quick, quick, quick. Okay, um, so Lamandra longifolia. That is one of our obviously indigenous uh, Lamandras, and um, it's a great plant. You can identify Lamandra longifolia by the tips of it are always a little bit. Uh, where are we? There we can go. You can see the little sort of um, clip edge to the tip that is a really good way of identifying the lamandra um this the lamandra longifolia straight is a great plant and i've got it around the garden but it can be a little bit sort of ungainly for smaller gardens so there are a couple of great cultivars these are two this is one which many of you will know it's called tanika and essentially it is a longer folia, but it has much finer foliage. Still has the typical spiky lamandra flower, um, but much more sort of flowy. Um, the good thing about the lamandras and other grass-like plants is they don't brown off through, or they usually don't brown off through summer. You might need to remove a few of the stalks, stems, but essentially they'll never brown off like a true grass like a poa or thimid or that those sorts of things so that uh, as you can see it's really bright green foliage quite flowy in the wind and sort of very nice for smaller gardens and then this is um, a form called nyala n-y-a double l-a and essentially it's a grey leaf form of the Lamandra longifolia. So from a design point of view, if you're going for more grey based plants in the garden, um, you can still use a Lamandra longifolia in the garden. Okay. This is the kangaroo grass or the Themida triandra that I, I mentioned earlier. That is um, a host plant to at least 13 species of butterflies. So that's the one. Um, it also has got beautiful, long and decorative uh, flowers and seed heads. Um, the parrots will come in for the seeds. Um, so it really is a wonderful little grass. Um, Carex, this is one of the many Carexes, really good for um, those kind of tricky areas in the garden that are always moist, um, but being a wetland plant, they will withstand drought as well. So they withstand both being inundated with water as well as um, completely drying out. Um, the Carexes and Sedges and Rushes, um, they're all really good plants, really good um, food plants for uh, caterpillars, for various moth species. Um, I was watching moths online. I've got a bunch of Carexes in the pond and moths are breeding on them and the frogs are there. So that's that whole ecosystem happening. And um, there's, yeah, so the Carex oppressor can be a little bit, um, sort of sharp and cutty, but the Carex fascicularis um, is very, very similar in form. You know, I might get to about uh, one and a half meters tall. Um, the fascicularis is really quite soft and has got a very, very decorative little flower head on it. So yeah, consider um, the bog type plants as well for those tricky areas in the garden. Okay, uh, Dianellus. Got, got a few dinellas that are indigenous to the area. This is Tasmanica, or this is a form of Tasmanica called Tas Red. Um, has got slightly reddish foliage. Um, these are the sort of clumping uh, ones. This particular form gets to about 45 centimetres tall, whereas the true Dianella Tasmanica might get to about 80 centimetres tall, and over time they clump up. Um, sometimes they can can be weedy in some people's gardens and they have to dig them out. They're good for sharing around. Um, 
gorgeous sort of sprays of dainty little blue flowers followed by blueberries uh, which are great for um, even things like blue tongues and birds and mammals and those sorts of things so um, in terms of habitat really good in terms of design really good uh, yeah and in terms of nice to look at really good uh, this is one of the poas um, this is what we sort of shortened to Poa Lab or Poa Labilladiri, which is a bit of a mouthful. Has a typical beautiful Poa um, flower heads, which aren't so good if you get hay fever <laughs> um, because they do produce quite a bit of pollen. So um, yeah, you, you can certainly get the sneezes from them. Um, this particular form is called Marma Blue, M-A-R-M-A -M -A Blue. And it is hopefully, as you can see, quite a grayish uh, grass so but the true form is much greener than that and probably a little bit sort of taller but uh, yeah a really nice form okay this lovely little one this is prostanthra melissifolia we've got a bunch of mint bushes in australia and this is one of them we also in this area we also have Prostanthera lassianthos, uh, the Victorian Christmas bush which is flowering at the moment. So Melissa Folia um, has finished flowering for the moment, comes in a purple flowering form or um, Callista pink, the pink flowering form. Um, oh. Always want to have a say. Bye bye. Um, gone to the other side of the river. Uh, so this gets to probably about three metres tall, um, but it's quite a narrow plant. So it can be, it's a good plant for those sort of, when you want vertical sort of plants, you want the height, but you don't necessarily want the width as much. Um, again, does great in full sun to dappled shade. Um, yeah, and nice little pink or purple flowers. One plant which actually I didn't even know was indigenous to the Shire of Yarra until a few days ago is the um, tree courier or the courier Lorenziana. I always thought it was only indigenous to um, New South Wales and Queensland, but it does. It comes down into uh, eastern Victoria. And I love this plant. I, I've used it in quite a few garden designs um, and it's essentially quite an upright courier. And um, it has got all the attributes, um, habitat attributes um, for the courier in terms of high nectar flowers, et cetera, et cetera. This particular form has got quite broad leaves, quite furry, not dissimilar to the pomoderus, I must say. So yeah, furry leaves, lighter green underneath and really lovely reddish sort of maroney stems. Um, might, you know, could potentially get to potentially four meters but probably usually top out at around three meters tall and maybe one and a half to two meters wide um, a really good plant for full shade um, and for dry shade as well so um, if you've got those really tricky spots which are quite narrow and dry shade um, is one of the really good plants for that um, two banksias i'd like to talk about um, that are indigenous to the area. Uh, so the Banksia spinulosa and the Banksia marginata. Um, and there are various forms of both of these plants, so dwarf forms essentially. The Banksia spinulosa, I mean, the birthday candles is one of the typical sort of um, forms that we know of. There's stumpy gold and coastal cushion, various small forms which get to about a meter um, and ditto marginata there's various sort of low growing forms of that as well so if you know you want something indigenous in the garden that's um, not at all shrub then you could certainly um, choose something smaller so spinulosa I'll try and show you the foliage there it's quite um, serrated and relatively thin um, gets probably to probably usually um, three meters tall and probably similar width so it is quite a wide plant but has in the incredible banksia cone flowers um, which are just an absolute magnet for the um, for the honey eating birds banksia marginata you can oopsie daisy maisie 
you can see it's got slightly different leaves, broader leaves. I've got the white back to the leaves. This is a, this will also get to probably about four-ish meters, um, but it's narrower than the spinulosa, so it might get to sort of two and a half-ish meters wide. Um, both, I mean, I, I would say banks is generally prefer full sun, uh, as do many plants in that family, the, the Proteaceae family. Um, generally speaking, they prefer drier conditions and full sun, whereas your bottle brushes, your calistamins, um, of which in Shire of Yarra, we've got two species, the um, Cyberi, the river bottle brush, which comes with a little cream flower or a little um, pink flower and the pallidus which has sort of got a yellowy color flower and both of those are sort of medium to tall shrubs. Um, Callistamins really don't mind boggy conditions um, and they don't mind the sort of dapple shade they're much more um, I suppose accepting of those types of conditions than um, plants in their proteaceae family which includes our hakeas, banksias, those sorts of things. Um, so that's probably all the plants that I've got, I think. Um, so I'm very happy to open the floor now to Sarah if you want to ask questions. Anyone wants to ask questions? I'm very happy for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that was so informative and um, I was busily, you know, writing stuff down for my own garden. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, we do have quite a few questions actually. So yep. what I'll do is I'll read some of them out. Yep. Um, Otherwise you can always email them to me and I can answer them and send the list of plants and then we can send everyone the list of plants plus the questions and, and the answers to the questions. Yeah, so one of uh, one of the questions was that people wanted a list of the plants um, yep. for some of the slides, uh, and also they probably want uh, lists of all of the ones that you've just presented yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've got quite a few questions here. Okay, so um, someone's asked about uh, their house uh, is in a mosquito infested location. Um, and is it possible to reduce or eliminate those mosquitoes through insect eating bats or birds? Um, and uh, frogs, if, if, I mean, the answer is yes, to a certain extent. Um, I mean, ponds are fantastic because you'll hopefully attract frogs and um, mosquito larvae form such an important um, part of the ecological chain. Um, it's just not funny for things like frogs. But then conversely, if you have a um, pond, it's likely that you're going to be having a bit more mosquito activity. So you, if you have a pond, you want to just get in lots of um, plants like your carrots and things, which are going to attract um, um, the frogs as well. So to try and reduce those numbers. Um, bats, yes, get up a couple of bat boxes if you can. Um, they will certainly help reduce numbers. Um, it is a bit tricky in terms of um, them breeding around the place. They, mosquitoes prefer shallow water uh, to breed in. So essentially they won't go for anything that's over 30 centimetres. So if you've got like pet bowls or, or bird baths that aren't cleaned out regularly, areas in the garden which might hold a bit of water, even plants like bromeliads and those other sort of water holding plants, they can all be um, a breeding area for mozzies. Uh, so try and eliminate them if you can. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the more, I know this is more of a sort of a long-term thing, but the more dense bushes that we've got where we're trying to get those little birds in, they really are a key to helping us um, deal with pest insects like mozzies because that's the main part of their diet is insects. I mean, all birds will use insects, certainly when, I mean, even honey eaters, they will supplement their diet with insects for their protein. Um, they also feed insects to their young. So everything pretty much eats, eats insects. We just need to provide that good habitat for them. So get some dense shrubs in there, eliminate um, unnecessary water around the place. Um, that They would be the key things and, and get up a, a couple of bat boxes, definitely. Yeah, interesting. Um, 
So Wayne has asked that he has a billabong that has lots of frogs in it mm. and literally overnight they disappeared. Uh, there was a big rain the day before and uh, the billabong is joined to a natural dry creek bed. He's asked, is it possible they washed away or swam away? Yeah, absolutely it's possible. And it's also possible that they actually didn't go anywhere because um, – one of the joys of those frog apps that I use is they tell you when the frogs call. And now, I mean, I don't know if you can hear it, but I have got that pobble bonk um, calling behind me. But usually I've got a bunch of different frogs and it's really quite rowdy. So the times that they're calling come and go depending on when they're looking for mates. Um, so it, it's possible that the frogs are actually still there Wayne but you're just not hearing them um, because some of them are so little Um, the fact that you've got a billabong and it's um, yeah connect they certainly some of them could have washed away some of the spawn could have washed away but uh, 100% they'll be back if they if they have actually even gone anywhere it's very windy where you are (laughs) it is can you still hear me Yes, yes. Yes, it is. The wind is certainly picking up. Yeah, you've got a beautiful garden. Um, So Nicole has asked for a um, a screening plant to go up against a one-point high um, metre fence, um, possibly even higher than that. Mm -hmm. Um, So currently she's got uh, bamboo growing there and a ringtail has built a nest. Ah. (laughs) Excellent. So maybe another, another screening plant. Yeah, okay, so it'd be good to know the width because obviously the taller the plant, generally speaking, the wider the plant. Um, so there's, um, and a, yeah, there's kind of lots of things to contend with, but generally, I mean, if you need something that's really quite narrow, I mean, things like the Grevillea rosemary folia, that can certainly um, cope with being pruned. I'm just looking at all the plants. Oh, a really good one, actually, which I didn't talk about. Here we go. Um, Acacia paradoxa or the hedging wattle Um, so that gets to roughly two-ish meters high Um, potentially could get to you know one and a half too wide but it's certainly one that can be pruned into a more sort of upright form if that's what she's looking for and that's quite not quite it's very prickly so it's really good to stop intruders and it's really good for for little birds and also good for stopping cats to come into your garden um the banksias do tend to be quite wide but as i also met the chorea the tree chorea is quite um quite an upright form um and then of course there's plenty of sort of natives that aren't in ditch things like callistum and slim which is an upright a very upright growing bottle brush um, that can be pruned to about 60 centimeters wide there's various lilipilies such as pinnacle or straight and narrow and again they have the height and not so much the width um, they're they're really good so yeah there's a bunch but um any anyone of course is welcome to come down to Karinga. So I'm there Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. One of the favourite parts of our jobs there is to help people get the absolute best plant for the spots in their garden. Um, Love doing it. Come down, bring a plan of your garden or a couple of photos or whatever and talk to us and we love troubleshooting. Um, But yeah, so there are a bunch of plants that would suit that sort of situation. And then, um, because you're probably, if you're pulling out the bamboo, um, you can put a um, couple of possum boxes in, which actually a a couple came in the nursery yesterday and they chopped down a yucca. I wanted to give them a medal for that. They chopped down a yucca and there's a ringtail possum nest in it. So they were coming in to get a box for a ringtail possum. So yeah, you can certainly do that as well. We had uh, lots of yuccas in my garden too that we had to get rid of. Um, (laughs) um, So this is a really good question. Someone's asked about, is there any good books on Indigenous plants and grasses uh, in the Yarra Ranges uh, with pictures? Um, That'd be good if you've got any suggestions. Yes, yes. Now, let me think that I should have had all my books here. Honestly, the best, 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 best book, and I don't even get commissioned for it, is um, The Flora of Melbourne uh, by Marilyn Bull. Essentially, she wrote it. Um, And what is so good about the book is, A, it has 
photos and or illustrations, but it has um, every locality is numbered and every plant has got that reference number. So you can, for example, here in Bend of Islands, I'm number 94. So I have gone through the entire book um, and highlighted all of the plants that are number 94 so that it's a really quick reference guide for me and you can you very quickly see how broad a palette plant palette you've got when you do something like that so floor of melbourne's got everything including the grasses including the water plants absolutely everything orchids all that sort of thing so that is one of my first choices um there's a guy who does a lot on water plants, but he also does grasses. And the name eludes me, it's Nick somebody. Um, his surname starts with an R. I'm sorry, I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's quite a long surname, but if you, even if you Google um, um, pond plants by Nick someone, um, you'll come across all his other books. He's got a range of books. He's fantastic, um, really knows his stuff. So th they're probably my first two. Um, ports of call. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Rangers also has uh, a list of um, weed species and native plant species. Um, so if you just go onto our website, you'll be able to find that and that's quite extensive. So please use that. Yep. Um, someone's also asked about the Facebook page that you have obviously mentioned at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, have I? <laughs> um, there's the Gardens for Wildlife. Um, there's um, Habitat Heroes, of course. Um, I don't specifically know which one you might be talking about, but of course, yeah, there's a range of Facebook sites for, for Habitat. That's okay. Um, someone's asked if they can grow a hakea in a pot. Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of hakeas from um, even ground cover hakeas through to very very tall hakeas and it's the same with a lot of plants like I mean we've got grevilleas that are ground covers through to grevillea robusta which is a um, like a 15-20 meter tree um, certainly you can grow uh, hakeas and pots just obviously get a decent sized pot for the type of plant you're trying to grow um, a lot of native plants do really well um, in containers because it's really free draining you can control the food you can control the water um, so yes is the answer thank you uh, and someone's asked any ideas about discouraging indian miners from the garden mm, that's a okay. really good one that is a good one. And it also, it's not only the Indian miners, it's also the native miners, which can be a little bit aggressive sometimes. I mean, not, we don't want to get rid of them, but we might want to discourage them a little bit. Um, essentially those types of birds and including the starlings, those sorts of birds, they generally tend to like open spaces. Um, so they'll, you'll kind of see them. So where I am, I'm sort of stuck in between Kangaroo Ground and Christmas Hills. And they're both areas which are, um, have got quite a bit of farmland, open fields and paddocks and things like that. Whereas where I am in Bend of Islands is just completely bushy. And on either sides, there's areas where the Indian miners are, but you just come a little bit in to Bend of Islands and there's just none and they never come there. And the reason it's a little bit scientific why they don't come there it's because they they do prefer those open spaces and they they um like an open space of three meters or more so essentially uh if you have more shrubs in your garden or more areas where you know you've got wider garden beds rather than big expanses of lawn um yeah the more essentially the more bushes you have in the garden the less of a problem you're going to have with indian miners Mm, okay we've got we've got a problem with crows at the moment <laughs> um so someone else has asked about rabbits we've got an uh, infestation where they live they haven't specified where they live though might live next door um because <laughs> we have got a big problem with rabbits okay so what i've learned about rabbits is uh, i hate tree guards well i hate the look of tree guards and i resisted for many many years putting tree guards because i just don't like the look of it but i uh, what i figured is i now put tree guards around everything 
and when you just need to get the plants to a certain point of maturity and the rabbits will be disinterested even if the plant is poking at the top of the tree guard um, a rabbit will hop past it rather than sit up and and nibble it generally speaking of course um, so you just want to protect the plant while it's young the other thing is what i've ended up doing um, I'm employing a, a man to come and shoot the rabbits. So he's um, very sensitive to native fauna. Um, he's a lovely person. So I know he's not a cowboy in terms of what he's going to shoot. Um, and the reason I do that is because I don't want to use poisons in the garden because it's going to potentially affect um, owls and this other animals that eat the rabbits that are dying. Um, and I don't want to target any of the native wildlife as well. It's really hard here. I'm on rocky clay soil. Um, so there's no burrows as such. They live under the house. They live under the tram. They live under shrubs. Um, so I can't net, can't use ferrets, any of those other things. So I am employing um, a man. I'm happy to include his details. He's registered. Um, Shire of Nillenbeck use him and yeah, just to come and shoot. And then also um, I'm using traps as well so essentially it's a humane trap it's just a cage trap and you put water and food in it um, but you still check the traps um, a few times a day to make sure that there's nothing in it um, and then I um, leave the, the trap for him and he euthanizes the animal really quickly so okay that, that's yeah it, it's so yeah. I find poisons too difficult because I just I don't like any critter suffering even if it's a pest animal yeah i agree it's hard um yeah. thank you for that though uh so someone's asked about seed uh feeders for native birds and they've been told to use a budgie seed mix only not sunflowers etc is that correct oh look it's that sort of um perpetual question really of do we don't we uh, northern hemisphere uh bird lovers don't have any issue with um, bird feeding but for some reason here in Australia we do. Um, I do use a mix that has sunflower seeds in, they don't get a lot. Um, I certainly understand um, the issues that come with it. I certainly do, um, you know, putting it in the same area can help spread disease. Um, it, potentially it creates beak deformities um, because of the high oil content in the sunflower seeds, um, which is why they don't get a lot. Um, so, but I mean, budgie seeds, they're more millet based. Um, so, I mean, that, that probably brings its own sets of problems because they're not eating their natural food, so to speak, which is why I would say whatever you're feeding them, just don't overfeed them. Um, generally, birds will only um, use us for a limited amount of their food. They will still go and forage. They will still look for their natural food as well. Um, so ideally, we want to be planting up a garden that's going to help support them in that way. I mean, I've got a lot of grasses through the garden and I often see uh, the rosellas just sitting in there and the galahs sitting in there just feeding um, on the seeds. So ideally, get some grasses into the garden um, for the seed eating birds and things like the alacasurina, the she oaks, um, they're fantastic. Um, acacias, a lot of the parrots eat acacia seeds, uh, so they're, they're the ones that I'd be going for. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, someone's actually asked about uh, rainbow lorikeets and how you discourage them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's. Uh, oh. The short answer is I don't know um, that they are kind of a problem. Um, they're, they're one of the birds which is certainly taking advantage of um, suburbia um, and the many sort of highly nectarous plants that, that are planted in the garden. Um, how can you discourage them? I don't know. Yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I actually don't really know the answer to that. Is don't have any nesting boxes in the area. Don't don't put any food out whatsoever. I'm not sure if they're putting out um, honey water or something like that, um, which they'd certainly um, be attracted to. But yeah, just try and avoid that. It'd be good to whoever 
ask that question. Sorry, I've forgotten if we could maybe get a bit more detail in in an email, and that that way I could do a little bit of research and um, answer a little bit more effectively. Because I'd never had to deal deal with a problem here in the bush, so I actually don't know the answer to that. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, when we when we send uh, the email to everyone on the mailing list, we'll just give a few details, and then we'll put your um, email address into. Um, but someone's asked about their frog bog um, and how can you tell whether it's healthy um, and they've put some native plants in it. Yeah, awesome. So that I mean, you can tell if it's healthy but not um, completely covered in algae. Ponds need probably to be sited where there's roughly 70% shade, 30% uh, sun. Um, so you want enough sun to start to develop a bit of algae, which the tadpoles feed on, um, but not so much that it overtakes the pond. Um, and I can very much speak from experience. Um, the second you get those native plants in there, um, your carexes and your juncus and um, water milfoils, those sorts of things, they will start sucking up the excess nutrients in the pond and um, that will essentially get rid of the algae. Since my pond, oh, turn it so you might be able to see it there, it's kind of in the distance, it's just a, a big bunch of greenery now, whereas it used to be a bit of a cesspool of algae. Um, it, it's healthy if it's not completely overridden with algae and there's critters in it. There'll be all sorts of little water critters um, jumping around in it. So that's pretty much how you can tell that it's healthy might have a bit of a smell. It shouldn't have an overwhelming um, like rotting smell or anything like that. Um, essentially in my pond, which is just a concrete hole in the ground, I used scoria. Um, I created different levels through it with scoria draped over weed mat and then brought in a bunch of logs to put on top to create habitat areas underneath took the plants out of the pot. They were just only tubes planted directly into the scoria. And honestly, they just grew like wildfire and that the pond has never looked back. So, I mean, you'd know if your pond was unhealthy, it would just be full of algae or have a horrible smell or there'd be no life and it'd be really stagnant, all those sorts of things. Mm, thank you. Um, so just one last question, um, just on supporting native bees in your garden. Yep. Uh, all of these indigenous plants that I've been talking about from your dianellas, um, which are a favorite of the blue banded bee um, to the herbertias, uh, you want a rain, you want plants, I know it does sound very general rather than very sort of particular and practical, but you want plants that flower all year round. How can you tell when they plant? Well, A, um, do a little bit of research on plants and you don't need heaps you, you know you don't need one that flowers that month and one that flowers that month go visit nurseries regularly and then you will see the huge range of plants that are in flower literally year round so that will give you a good picture of uh, of what to plant I mean indigenous to the area there's a gorgeous little shrub called Pamelia humulus um, which is a white flowering Pamelia um, the butterflies and other insects absolutely love it um, as I mentioned, things like the Chrysocephalum, the native daisies, um, Hibertia, um, the Hardenbergia, the happy wanderer and the shrub forms. Um, essentially, most things with flowers, um, the bees will go for. So that's how you can support them from that point of view. From a water point of view, really shallow bowl with um, pebbles, um, keep it regularly filled with water, you'll see they'll come often. And insect hotels, people often come into the nursery and say, oh, do, do insects really go in them? And honestly, we've barely got them unpacked from the box and, and hung them up and the native bees or wasps are coming in to check them out. So they do use them. They need to be placed in a sheltered position. So you don't want to put them out in the garden where they're going to get rained on and lots of wind. Uh, they're really good under eaves. Um, or sort of a north facing aspect somewhere where it's going to be warm where it's um, yeah not going to be exposed to westerly sun and and wind and rain but they they work as well so thank you for that yeah sounds like uh, I'm going to have to get my little boy out and start making some insect hey, hotels yeah <laughs> um 
That's been so informative. You're such a wealth of knowledge. It's unbelievable. Um, and uh, Karanka Nursery, uh, that garden there is amazing. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. So please go down. Yeah, come down and say Please hi. go down. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for, for that. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on this, this Sunday. Um, so happy gardening. Yeah, thank you. Go out you. There, and thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's all right. See you later.